Well, we just read Psalm 57, and in order to better understand it, uh, we're given a psalm heading. And not all psalms have psalm headings, but Psalm 57 does. Uh, and this psalm heading tells us who wrote the psalm uh, and what was going on uh, when the writer wrote it, what was going on in his life. And the heading reads like this, to the chief musician set to do not destroy uh, a, a mictum of David when he fled from Saul into the cave. So David wrote this psalm, and he wrote it when he was on the run from King Saul. And the reason he's on the run from King Saul was because Saul, who was king, was crazy with envy against David. You see, Saul was Israel's first king, but he sinned against God by disobeying God's commands. And the prophet Samuel said to King Saul that God was going to take the kingdom from him and give it to a man that was better than him. And then Samuel anointed David, a young teenager at the time, of the house of Jesse, to be Israel's next king. Well, over time, David became King Saul's harp player to soothe the erratic emotional state of Saul. Saul was a mess. He was, he was a mental mess. Uh, and then David came to national prominence when he fought the Philistine giant Goliath and killed him. Then King Saul made him a commander in his army, and David had military success after military success and was becoming the darling of all of Israel. So much so that after the slaughter of, of the Philistines, we read in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 6 and 7, now it had happened as they were coming home, that's from the battle, when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistines, that a woman, that the women had come out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. So the women sang as they danced and said, here it is, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. David his ten thousands. And that made Saul mad troubled him greatly and made him rage with jealousy that David would be praised for killing more people than he would be praised for killing. And Saul was determined to eliminate David, knock him off, so that David wouldn't one day take the kingdom. And for over four years, he chases David with his army all over Israel, trying to kill him. And David said to Jonathan, his good friend and Saul's son, actually, in 1 Samuel 20, he said, as your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. Well, from 1 Samuel chapter 21 to the end of that book, David and his band of 400 worthless men are a band on the run. And we see David fleeing from Saul's palace in Gibeah, then to Samuel and Ramah, then to Nob, where he is given the priest's bread. Then he seeks refuge with Ashish, uh, who is the king of Gath, but fakes insanity and then is tossed out of there. Then he flees to Adullam, which is a, a cave, uh, and this one is one of the two caves that he, fl he flees to. The second one is the cave in Engedi, which is the cave the majority of commentators believe uh, that he is in now while he is writing Psalm 57. So while he is holed up and hiding from Saul and his army in this cave, he writes Psalm 57. And for the most part, we believe he has written at least 10 psalms while he's on the run from Saul. Uh, and in this psalm, we see, we, we see is what, what the heart of a man who trusts God in the most trying of circumstances. And what I would like to look at today is I'd like to look at this psalm using a three-point outline, which will be in the back of your bulletin if you have one, and if you don't, raise your hand, and one of the ushers will give you one. And that is the plea for protection, the pain, the pains of persecution, and the promise of praise. The promise of praise. So let's look at the plea for protection. I'll read verses 1 to 3 again in Psalm 57. And there he cries out, Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for my soul thirsts for you. And in the shadow of your wings I will, take, I will make my refuge until these calamities have passed by. I will cry out to God most high, to God who performs all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me. He reproaches the one who would swallow me up. Selah. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. Well, David's in a cave uh, and, and he's always looking over his shoulder uh, because Saul is scouring the country looking for him. And I'm sure he's getting weary, right? Weary living like a fugitive. Uh, and although he's, he's helped his fellow countrymen by fighting for them during this time and defeating their enemies, what's happened is they've gone to Saul and they've told Saul where, where David's been hiding out even though David has helped them. So his own countrymen are betraying him. 
Well, while he's inside the cave in En Gedi, uh, Saul is outside with his men, circling around, trying to figure out where he is, and he goes inside the cave to relieve himself. And David has a chance to kill Saul. He's right there, and his men say to him, do it, man, kill him, kill him. But David won't do it. He won't do it because he knows it's not his place to do it. He, he, he knows that God, who is God over all, has anointed Saul, and he'll take Saul out in his time and in his way. So he will not lift his hand against the king. But David knows, David knows that Saul has no problem killing him. And so he says twice in verse 1, Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me. And he says it twice because he desperately needs God's mercy. And, and he knows what he needs, and he knows only God can give it to him. And he knows that God is a God of mercy, and that he's the Father of mercies, and that he delights in mercy. As Lamentations 3.22 says, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions or his mercies never fail. They don't fail. And in Luke chapter 1, verse 50, we're told, his mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. And listen, what we want and what we need and what we will be crying out for all the days of our lives is mercy. Right? Mercy because of our sin. Right? Mercy because of our enemies. Mercy to keep us from temptations and evil. Mercy because of the situations that our own sin has put us in, and so on and so on. Now the reason David asks God for mercy is because he, he trusts in God. For he, says, for he says, for my soul trusts in you. My soul trusts in you. And David trusts in God because he has found God to be trustworthy, and he has found him to be trustworthy over and over again. He knows that God is the creator. He knows that he's the lawgiver. He knows that he is just and sovereign and holy and all wise and good and faithful. Right? So he knows who God is and he knows God intimately. Therefore, he trusts every single word of God and he trusts every promise of God. And God has promised that David will one day be the king. He promised he would be the next king. And quite a few years have passed since he's gotten this promise. And the Vegas odds at this point of David becoming king are probably worse than the New York Knicks winning the NBA championship this year. Not good. <laughs> Yet God promised David he would be king. And David trusts God and he believes that he one day will be king. And David is a man after God's own heart precisely because he trusts God. Precisely because he trusts him. And you know, a life... A life of confidence in God is a great evidence that, that one is truly alive to God. And then if you're not trusting in Him, uh, then, then you're either trusting in yourself or in someone else or in something, in, in, something else in, in general, something. Uh, and, then, and then sadly, you are, you are bound for misery and failure if you're not trusting in Christ. So brothers and sisters, we, we can't look at our situations or, or the state of the world around us uh, and and. And, and get worried about it. No, we look at, to God's infallible, inerrant, and holy word, and we trust every word of it. We trust what he says and what it says about him and what it says about us and what it says about, about the life and the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. We trust it. We trust in the blessings and the promises that are given in his word to all who believe in him. We trust that our sin debt was paid in full when Jesus cried out, it is finished. We trust that that was it. It was done. And we trust that in his righteousness, his sinless, perfectly obedient life, it now covers our lives and that now God sees us that way. Now some might think it's strange that David, the anointed king of Israel, would be in a cave hiding for his life. I mean, why should he suffer so? Why should he suffer so? But as we see over and over again in the scriptures and in, 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 in life in general, God's people are not immune to trials and suffering and persecution. In fact, we're promised some of those things. But we're not immune to those things. God allows and ordains his people to go through some fire, to purify them, to hone them, and to prepare them to be useful, useful vessels for him. So we ought not to think it's strange when we are in the cave, so to speak. We ought not to think that's strange when our enemies are hunting us down, to take us down. And listen, our enemies may be people, uh, but if they are, they're tools of our greater enemy who is Satan, 
who relentlessly wages war against us, hurling fiery darts at our heads and at our hearts. And add to that our own sin, which so easily besets us, is knocking at the door of our hearts, trying to gain access into it. So we ought not to think it strange. Well, David trusts in God and therefore says, In the shadow of your wings I will make my refuge until these calamities have passed by. And in the shadow of your wings is, a, is figurative language. Uh, and, and the picture here is of a baby chick going under the, the wings of the mama bird for protection. And David used this language in other places as well. And in Psalm 61.4, he says, I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. He said in Psalm 17.8, he said, keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wings. And again, he said the same thing in Psalm 36.7. And Jesus used, used this figure of speech when he wept over the unbelief, over the unbelief of Jerusalem, over the unbelievers in Jerusalem. In Matthew 23, verse 37, he cried out, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. But you were not willing. So he's saying, I would have protected you. I would have protected you from the wrath to come. I would have protected you from the wages of your sins, but you wouldn't have it. You wouldn't hear it. Listen to what Ulysses Aldovarandi said in the 16th century concerning the hen and her chicks. He said this. He said, at the first sign of a predator, mother hens will immediately gather the chicks under the shadow of her wings. And with this covering, they put up a very fierce defense. They would rather die for their chicks than seek safety in flight. They would rather die for her chicks than seek safety in flight. So what David is saying is there's no safer place on earth for the saints. No safer place on earth than under the wings of God, so to speak. So when you need safety from temptation, run under the shadow of his wings. When you need rest because your soul is weary, run under the shadow of his wings. When you need calm amidst the storm because it's going all over the place, run under the shadow of his wings. When you need a safe haven from the lure of sexual immorality and temptation and the pull of pornography, run under the shadow of his wings. When fear and anxiety are ravaging you, run under the shadow of his wings. There you will find protection. So God is our refuge and we are safe in him. Right? Whether we're in the fiery furnace or the lion's den or in a classroom with an atheistic, Christ, atheistic Christian-hating professor, right? he is our protector. The Lord protects us. And what he is ultimately protecting is our eternal life. Yes, he helps us physically. Yes, he helps us emotionally now. Yes, he does. But many Christians are martyred. And his own son was put to a violent death. Which, by the way, he ordained. But no one can touch the soul. No one can touch the soul. Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 10, 28, he said, Do not fear those, those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. He says, but rather fear him, God, who is able to destroy, to destroy both body and soul in hell. So the worst anyone could ever do to you, the worst thing any person could ever do to you is take your life. That's what he's saying. But all that would do to the Christian is catapult you into heaven. So no one can touch your soul. They can't touch your soul because Jesus said in John 10, 27 and 28, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life. Here it is. And they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. That's where you are. You're in the hand of God. You will not perish. It doesn't say you won't have persecution. It doesn't say you won't have trials and trouble. It won't say your body won't hurt like anything. No one's going to touch your soul. Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 3.3, 3, he said that the Lord is faithful 
who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. And in Isaiah 41.10, the Lord tells his people to fear not. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So God is David's refuge, right? Till his calamities pass. And his calamities in Psalm 57 is that Saul is seeking his life to kill him. And we all have calamities. We all do. All right? And they're bound to come all of our saved days. And, and our only refuge in our calamities is the Lord. And, and David made God his refuge. And then he said that he would cry out to God Most High, to God who performs all things for me. And God Most High, that, that means that God is over all. He's Most High. He's over all. That he has all power and all authority and he is sovereign over everything in this life. And to David's case, he is sovereign over Saul and he is sovereign over Saul's army. It means that God is bigger than my problems and he's bigger than your problems. It means that there is nothing that can stand between God and my need and nothing that can stand between God and your need. Right? He is sovereign over Satan and the demons. And he is sovereign over all evil. And, and they all tremble before him. And they can do nothing unless he allows it. And if he does allow it, it's always to fulfill his purpose. So you see, David goes straight to the top. He doesn't go to his counselors. He doesn't go to his buddies in, in the cave with him, right, for help. Right? He beseeches God most high. And he hears him. And when he is God most high to us, when he's God most high to us, we will go straight to him and we won't worry. We won't fear man. We won't be slow to pray. We won't be slow to praise him. And, and when God, when he is most high to us, right, we'll be quick to repent of our sin. We'll be quick to repent. Well, God is the one who performs all things for David, meaning that God accomplishes and completes and fulfills all for his purposes for David's life. Uh, and David knows that without him, he could do nothing. And, and we know that the Lord will perform all things for us, but we got to let him. We got to surrender. We got to surrender our will to his will. We have to surrender every area of our lives to him. Right? We got to trust that his ways are better than our ways for us. We got to believe, we got to believe what Romans 8.28 says, and believe you me, man, I'm praying this now, that all things work together for good to those who love God. Do you believe that? Do I believe that? Well, if we believe that, no matter what's coming our way, no matter what ill hits us, no matter what struggle we're burdened with, we got to believe that, that God is working something good for us even though we can't see it now. So David says, I will make God my refuge and I will cry out to him. And then he says, he, says he knows what the response will be. He says in verse three, you shall send from heaven and save me. Right? He reproaches the one who would swallow me up. Selah, God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. So God will, will send from heaven and save David. God will deliver him and eventually put him on the throne of Israel. And, and from David will one day come the everlasting king. From the earthly king will one day come the everlasting king. And what God will send from heaven to deliver David is his mercy and his truth. So those who try to swallow up David... Those who thirst for his blood will be, a, be reproached by God. And he will speak and act against those who wickedly seek to destroy David. Listen, we live in a fallen world where there is great wickedness and there is all kinds of evil and it abounds. What we have to do is turn on the news and you'll see it. And it may seem like the bad guys are winning. It may seem like evil is getting away with it. But God will reproach them and he will deal with them justly and he will judge them for every idle word and deed. And some will suffer for their sins in this life, but all will suffer for their sins in the next life. No one's getting away with anything from the almighty eye and mind of God. Or as Paul said in Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. In other words, we all have to stand before God and answer for how we live this life. Words, thoughts, deeds. 
And so we see the plea for protection. Secondly, the pains of persecution in verses 4 to 6. He says, My soul is among lions, a lie among the sons of men who are set on fire, whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue is a sharp sword. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have dug a pit for me. Into the midst of it, they themselves have fallen. Selah. Well, David prays and pleads for God's protection. Now in verses 4 to 6, he tells us how he's actually persecuted. And he says, my soul is among lions. And he's not talking about literal lions, but men who devour and tear apart. Men who are vicious and strong and proud. Men like that in Psalm 7, verse 2, that tear apart the soul, rending it to pieces. So David is among lions. And he's, he's among the sons of men who are set on fire, he says which means these men are fire-breathing. They are filled with fury. They are filled with wrath against David. He says their teeth are like spears and arrows and their tongue is a sharp sword. Right? So in other words, they use words to lie and deceive and to manipulate and slander and to hurt David. Right? They may seem like they're for him, but behind his back, they let Saul know where he is. And behind his back, they have no problem stabbing the knife into it. And we know how powerful words are. And we know how damaging they can be. Proverbs 12, 18 says that rash words are like sword thrusts. Like sword thrusts. Proverbs 25, 18 says, a man who bears false witness against his neighbor is like a club, a sword, and a sharp arrow. Those are all things that really hurt. And speaking, speaking of his disobedient people in Jeremiah 9, 8, God said this about them. He said, their tongue is an arrow, shot out. It speaks deceit. No one speaks peaceably to his neighbor with his mouth, but in his heart, he lies in wait. All right, in other words, the wicked use their words like a weapon. And at times we've done that, have we not? At times we've done that. We've said things to hurt people because they've hurt us and we want to hurt them back. And sadly, I have used words to hurt people. And you know who I hurt the most with the words when I hurt people with words? The people I love the most. My very own family. But as Christians, that's not how we're to use words. Ephesians 4.31 says, we're to put away gossip, put away slander, stop speaking evil and falsehood, stop using flattery. And instead, we're told in Colossians 4.6 that our speech should be always be with grace and seasoned with salt, which is another way of saying, use words that encourage. Use words that build people up. And as Proverbs 16, 21 says, our speech should be sweet and increase learning. Well, David's enemies not only use words to trap him, but for its six says, they've prepared a net for his steps. So like an animal, they're setting traps to capture him. And did not the enemies of Jesus set traps to try to capture him? Sometimes with questions like, is it lawful? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? Or like this woman who's caught in adultery, Jesus, Moses said we should stone her. What do you say? Like Judas getting offered money to betray him. Like gathering up false witnesses to give faulty testimony about Jesus. Like jerry-rigging the trials of Jesus like telling people that Jesus operated under the power of Satan. Yeah, that's how he does his miracles. He's satanic and so on. Listen, the enemies of those who follow Christ spare no effort to take him down. Politicians set traps by passing laws to limit Christians, mandating mandating that we must go against our our beliefs and conscience and and give our services to either same-sex marriage weddings or, or if you're in the medical field, you must participate in abortions if you want to keep your job and so on. They have laws and, and rules to silence us on the streets or in public areas. The media and Hollywood set traps by spewing propaganda against us to turn public opinion against us. The educational system sets traps by rewriting history. They take God out of the equation. Right? And, and they, they, they scorn Christianity instead of looking at things like the, 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 the things like what happened in the 17th century, the Great Awakening, how it was the catalyst to bring us into the Revolutionary War. 
set men's heart of flame on fire. Well, because of this oppression, David says, my soul is bowed down. My soul is bowed down. Another way of saying, I'm weary. I'm losing heart. I'm dejected. And then he says, they've dug a pit for me. Into the midst of it, they themselves have fallen. And here we have a twist of fate. Boom, all of a sudden we have a change going on. It's a twist of fate. Right? They, they've dug this for me. Here David lets us in on why he trusts God when he cries out to him. Because in the end, God delivers his people. The enemies set traps to destroy him, or in this case, they dig pits, but they themselves end up falling into the pit. This reminds us of Haman. Remember Haman in the book of Esther? He hates the Jew Mordecai. He can't stand them. He's furious with them. And he hates them so much, he builds gallows to hang them on. But in the end, what, who hangs on the gallows? Haman himself. Haman himself. So the wicked seek to maim you. They plan and scheme to hurt you. But in the end, and at the end of the day, it is, it is their wickedness that God judges and condemns. You see, by fighting against you, they're fighting against God. Why? Because you're a child of God and he protects his children. He protects his children. This is why Jesus said to Saul of Tarsus in Acts chapter 9, verse 4, when he was on the road to Damascus to imprison and put to death Christians, he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me, Saul? In Matthew 25, verses 42 and 43, Jesus is speaking to the goats on the day of judgment. And he says this to them. He says, I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. I was naked and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And then we read that the, the goats say, when... When did we see you all these ways? When did we see you and not do anything for you? We don't recall this. Jesus answers in verse 45 and he says, Inasmuch as you did not do it to the least of these, my brethren, you did not do it to me. You didn't do it to me. So how others treat you is how they treat Jesus. How they treat Jesus. And he takes it personally. He takes it personally. And he deals with it as such. Well, between verses 4 and 6, David says in verse 5, Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. So be exalted, O God, in my situation. Be exalted in how I trust you in my time of trial. Be exalted, O God, because although I'm in the cave, I, I, I know you will put me on the throne. And, and, and we should say, be exalted, O God, for I know this momentary light affliction is working an eternal weight of glory in me. I know it. We should say, be exalted, O God, in, in how I deal with my unsaved spouse or how I battle against sexual immorality. Be exalted, O God, in my constant pain and suffering and sorrow. And may, may my trial bring you glory even as David's trial brought you glory. And, and this, by the way, was, was David's greatest desire, that God would be glorified uh, while, while he was running for his life. Right? No complaining, no doubting, no seeking human wisdom, just trusting in God for the glory of God. And listen, the, the reason David sought the glory of God above all else, all else is because he saw himself as absolutely nothing and God is everything. He had a massive view of God and he had a correct view of himself. God is everything and I am nothing. He was a man who was poor in spirit. He was a lowly man and he had a high view of God. And he knew he needed God for everything. And how do we know this? Well, because he cried out for mercy, which means he, he saw himself as unworthy. Mercy means I give you what you don't deserve. Right? If you deserve mercy, then you wouldn't need mercy. Right? Mercy means give me something I don't deserve. And he knew that. So he, he knew he wasn't worthy of it. And he cried out for refuge, which means he knows he's not self-sufficient. I can't help myself. I need refuge. And he calls, he calls his refuge the shadow of God's wings, which means he knows he's really weak, just like a little chick. So the mighty warrior who killed his 10,000s saw himself as a helpless little chick in need of mercy and protection. 
Therefore, humility, humility is the path to worshiping and glorifying God. He was a humble man. You can't worship God if you're not a humble person. You can't magnify the greatness of God and at the same time magnify yourself in some way. So the question is, do you glorify God by seeing yourself the way David saw himself? There's absolutely nothing. And God is everything. And so we see the plea for protection, the pains of persecution, and thirdly, the promise of praise. The promise of praise in verses 7 to 11. He said, There, my heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise. Awake, awake my glory. Awake lute and harp. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing to you among the nations. For your mercy reaches unto the heavens and your truth unto the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. Well, David has fierce enemies. But he knows God will deliver him and foil their schemes. So he says, my heart is steadfast, O God, my heart is steadfast. And to be steadfast means to be firm, to be established, to be unmovable. So in all of his troubles, his confidence in God will not be shaken is what he's saying. And the reason his heart is steadfast on God is because God's love is steadfast on him. So a, a steadfast heart won't abandon God or lose hope when the going gets tough. A steadfast heart will trust God in the cave or in the hospital or in, in bankruptcy or in fire or in the flood. A steadfast heart knows the mercy of God and the goodness of God and has spent much time in the shadow of his wings. A steadfast heart hangs on every single word of God regardless of what the culture thinks, regardless of what some even other professing Christians think. A steadfast heart says what Paul said in Romans 3, let God be true and every man a liar. And a steadfast heart will not bow to an idol. And brothers and sisters, we need more than anything today to know the truth and not budge one inch off the truth of who God is and what he says. And, and, and we should be aiming for and praying for a steadfast heart. Because we all have struggles and we all have troubles and we at times have very strong temptations and, and we have people who push our buttons and are hunting us down and we have marital problems and, and we have all kinds of challenges in our lives. Right? And, and we have people who let us down and abandon us and we have people who throw us under the bus. We have children who are rebellious and who are difficult to deal with. And we have ongoing illnesses and we have struggles and on and on and on. So we need to be steadfast. And we need to be steadfast in our faith of God. We need to be anchored in the God of our salvation because God doesn't abandon us and he doesn't let us down. He is always faithful. He always loves us. He will always be our father who cares for us. Listen, human fathers, love him as we do. They can abandon us. They can let us down. They can throw us under the bus. They can give us really poor counsel. Love them as we do. But God is a faithful father, and he's perfect in all of his ways, and he won't let us down, and, and he's out for our ultimate good, and he's out for his glory. So we don't have to fear, and we don't have to worry. One commentator said this. He said, when it is clearly manifest to the heart of man that God is most high, he fears nothing, not even the devil and his host of hell. Well, because David's heart is steadfast on God the most high, he can sing praises to him in the cave. He says, I will sing and give praise. And I guess the question is, how can a Christian not sing praise to God? I mean, how can a Christian not sing praises to God? I mean, it is the natural response to God's love and all the benefits that we receive from him through Christ and the course. It's just a natural response. If someone keeps loading you up with blessings upon blessings upon blessings upon blessings, you cannot help but be thankful, right? How could we not? We should be singing praises to God. It's the overflow of the love of God in our hearts. 
That's why we're told in Ephesians 5.19 to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing is joyful. So David will praise God with all of his being, which is why he says, Awake, my glory. Awake, lute and harp. Right? So, 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 so may my soul be roused to praise and magnify God. May my troubles not dull my soul from praising God and glorifying Him. And then he says three I wills. I will awaken the dawn, meaning I will praise God early. I will praise you among the people and I will praise you among the nations. And what David is saying is, I'm going to praise you when I get out of this cave. I'm praising you now and I'm going to praise you when I get out of this cave. When I get out of here, I'm going to let men know of your mercy toward me and your goodness toward me. And guess what this is, folks? Besides encouragement to the saints, this is evangelism. This is evangelism. This is telling others what great things God has done for you through Christ. This is telling them how he saved you, how he saved you from the pit of hell and how he can save them too from the same place. Reminds me of the demoniac who Jesus cast a legion of demons out of. And after he cast a legion of demons out of him, the demoniac who's no longer a demoniac wants to go with Jesus and wants to go with his disciples. He wants to go with them. But Jesus said to him in Mark 5, verses 19 and 20, he doesn't let him go with him. He says this, go home to your friends. Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you. I don't need you with me, man. I need you back there in Decapolis. Tell them what great things that God has done through me for you. Go tell them that. And how he has had compassion on you. Here it is. And he departed and began to proclaim How long did he wait? And he departed and began, right? As soon as he got moving the other way, right? Began to proclaim in Decapolis, that's 10 cities, by the way. That's 10 cities, right? He lived in an area of 10 cities. He went to all of them, I'm sure, right? All that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. And has not God done great things for us? Who among us that knows the salvation of God cannot say he's done great things for us? Forget about all the things that he does and the little things in our life. He's given us life and life abundantly in Christ. So when we breathe our last, we know where we're going. We know has us. He's done great things for us. Has not his mercy reached to the heavens for us to bring us to spiritual life? He's adopted us into his family. Listen, not everybody can call God father, but the one that he saves and adopts into his family becomes the son of God. Now he's your father. Therefore, we should be filled with joy and have joy and confidence and share the gospel with those around us. Well, I'd like to close by leaving you four things, four things we can learn from David in the cave. And the first is this, that God wants to be glorified in our trials. God wants to be glorified in our trials. Now, of course, he wants to be glorified all the time. It's not just trials. Well, I wait for trials. I can glorify God. No, he wants to be glorified all the time. Uh, He says so in, in... in 1 Corinthians 10.31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. But, but that certainly includes our trials and suffering and persecution. So instead of asking God why, why when troubles come, we should be asking, Lord, help me to glorify you in this trial. I'm not crazy about it. It doesn't feel great. I don't really like it. I certainly wouldn't have chosen it for myself, but you've given it to me and you're much wiser than I am. Help me to glorify you in this trial. And the way we glorify him in trials is that we trust him and we anchor on his word even when the storms are raging. We hold fast then. Even though all others have jumped ship, we hold fast. So you gotta ask yourself, is God glorified by whatever trial you are going through this day? Whatever it is, could be small, could be big, who knows what it is. But whatever it is, whatever trouble you're going through, whatever suffering you're going through, whatever whatever's going on that you're not happy with in your life and wish it wasn't there, Is he glorified in that? Because let me tell you, if you're complaining about it, he's not glorified. If you're moaning and groaning about it, he's not glorified. But if you're praying that he'd give you grace with it and that his name would be exalted in it, that he'd teach you whatever lessons he wants to teach you if there are lessons to learn, he's glorified. The second thing we learn from David in the cave is that God is greater than our problems. You may have really big problems in your life. They may be colossal problems. But God is greater than those colossal problems. 
Right? And he's been handling massive problems for the saints since the beginning of time. And he can and he will handle yours as well. In fact, he promises to do that. Therefore, there is no need for us to worry. There is no need for us to start thinking of the 101 what ifs. Well, what if this, if what if that, but what if this, if what if that, but what? Right? We don't have to do that. Right? What we need to continually think on is that he is God most high. He, he's not going to let you fall off the edge of the world. Again, the worst thing that can happen is somebody take your life, but then it puts you in the presence of God, which far outweighs anything we have here. The third thing we learn from David in the cave is that God doesn't abandon us in our trials. It may seem that way, and certainly Satan tempts us to think that. Right? He wants us to question and doubt God's love for us. Listen, he's saying to us, if God really loved you, you know, why are you in this cave? Why are you in this predicament? Why are you struggling so greatly? Why are you a child of God under such attack? Yet the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all with us and preserving us for the day of redemption. And as Hebrews 1.14 says, the angels are ministering to those who are being saved even now. So we have God in us and the angels around us upholding us till we are called home. We have this unbelievable army of power, God himself, and angels protecting and keeping us. He's with us. Amen. The fourth thing we learn from David in the cave is that trials and sufferings can and should awaken us to praise him as we ought. They should awaken us to praise him as we ought. When things go south, so to speak, that, that's when we must go north or must seek God. It, it's often true, is it not, when things are going good, when everything is okay, everything is good, no one's bothered with you, things are just moving along, you know, going okay, it, it, it's easy to get lulled to sleep, to be on sort of spiritual autopilot, right? Yeah, you pray, you read a little bit, but you're not fervent. You're not pleading. You're not crying out. But trials, they stir that up, right? When things are rough, when you're really like, like at the end of your rope, they stir it up and they remind us of our deep need and dependence upon God. That's what they do. And nothing awak awakens a sleepy soul like meditating on the gospel. Meditating on the gospel. Considering, considering the wonder again of how God saved you putting all of your sins on his son, right? We should never get tired of this. This should never be like, oh yeah, no, 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 save life for my sins. No. Christ out of love, not out of obligation for us. We don't deserve anything. We deserve hell is what we deserve. Out of love came to save a people. And the father out of love chose us. He didn't have to choose us for anything. He should have let us all be damned. If we got what we deserved, that's what we would get, right? But out of love, he chooses us. Out of love, Christ comes to save us. Out of love, he goes to the cross for us and God puts our sins on him. And he pays for every one of them. Suffers on the cross six hours, suffering the divine wrath of God for sins you've committed, which you would spend all eternity in hell paying for and never finish paying for them. But he did it for you in six hours. And he finished the job. And he rose again from the dead to prove he finished the job. And now he gives you a right holy standing in Christ. He forgives you of all your sins and, and he, he gives you a, a holy standing. The perfect life that Jesus lived now is it's, it's put on you as if you lived it. And God accepts you in him. Sins are gone. Righteous life lived. You have eternal life forevermore in Christ. We should meditate on that over and over again. We take the Lord's Supper. We receive it once a month to remember that. To remember that. Right? He wiped the slate clean with his own blood, making us new creations in him. Amen? Now, if you're not a new creation today, if you haven't been born again, uh, then you don't need to hide from the troubles in this life. No, you need to hide from the trouble that's coming in the next life. Right? And the problem is, you cannot hide from God. You can't. There's no refuge from the wrath of God on the day of judgment. Hebrews 10.31 says, It is a fearful thing, it is a very fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And it's a fearful thing because here's why God doesn't wink at sin. He, he doesn't tolerate sin. It is lawlessness against his holy law and he punishes it with an eternal death. And there is only one safe place in all the universe for you and here it is. It is in Christ. That's it. 
It's not in religion. It's not in money. It's not in nice people. It's not in doing good things. It is in Christ. And to be in Christ is to be, in, is to be covered by his atoning sacrifice. To be in Christ means that on the day of judgment, the wrath of God is going to pass right by you because it's already, already been put on Christ. He has suffered the wrath of God for you on the cross. He suffered the wages of your sins. He has underwent or undergone your eternal death and he has paid for your hell. And the reason he did so is because he loves you. That's it. That's it. He loves you. Came to save you because he loves you. And the question is, do you believe it? Do you believe it? You see, you got to know that you're in deep trouble. you got to know that your sin will hunt you down in the end and it will damn you. But you can run to Christ this day. And his arms are wide open to receive you. Your sin will damn you. Yes, it will. But his wings will receive you and cover you and the damnation will go by you because it's already gone on him. And he will not turn you away. He will take the sinner who truly seeks him into himself and he will forever secure you in his love and by his power. So then, therefore, what should you do? You should come to Christ today. You should submit to Christ today. All right? You should surrender to Christ today. Repent of your sins today. Come as now his arms are open. Don't come tomorrow. Don't come next week. You don't know you have next week. But his arms are open today. Come today. Come and find life and forgiveness and love and protection. Amen. Come. Let's pray as the ushers come forward. Father, thank you that you have blessed multitudes of people, sinners who wanted nothing to do with you, and given them life in your Son, changed wicked hearts, taken hard-hearted hearts, and made them alive that beat for you. Father, I pray as your people that we would continually run to you, that we would trust in your sovereign will over our lives, that we would cry out to you always, that, Lord, we would not see our troubles and trials, uh, Lord, as a thing, uh, Lord, to be disdained, um, but, Lord, that a, a sovereign God who loves us has allowed them and ordained them, and may you be glorified through them. And if it be your will, that you would take them away. And, Lord, may we be a people who praise you. May we be a people, Lord, who tell them what great things God has done for us here, outside of this place, and, Lord, all over the world and so that your name would be magnified and glorified. And now, as Father, we give back to you. I pray that this giving would be from a heart of great gratitude, a heart that delights in you, that sings praise to you, and that you would use these monies for the furtherance of your kingdom. In Christ's name, amen.